So God is all-powerful, that's our theme tonight. Or to put it as the Bible puts it in a question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Does God really rule everything? Did God send coronavirus? Some people say the devil is winning. Other people say God is good, but he's weak. He can't make things work out the way he wants. But we say God is all-powerful. And I want to start by pointing out that we, you and I, are not as powerful as we sometimes like to think we are. I read somewhere recently that now Boris Johnson has announced the end of COVID no less than seven times. I don't blame him for that, but it's just an indication of how we as human beings are not in control. The first time he announced the end of COVID was right back the 19th of March 2020, when he said that it would probably all be over in 12 weeks, and he was confident that we would send coronavirus packing as a country. And shortly after that, of course, he himself ended up in hospital, very seriously ill. So it just goes to show, doesn't it, that even the Prime Minister is not all-powerful. We are less in control of our lives than we like to think. We are more in God's hands than we realize. You might talk to a friend and, and say to her, well, look, surely you thank God for this beautiful house you've got. And she might turn around and say to you, no, 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 no. No, we worked for this house, we did. We worked for it. It's our house. My husband and I, we worked extra overtime and took all the hours we could in order to raise the deposit and pay the mortgage on this house, and we're still working now. No, we don't thank God for this house. It's down to us. But your friend is perhaps forgetting that it's in God's hands whether she has the health to keep working in this way. It's in God's hands whether she and her husband stay married with all that strain of all this work on their marriage. It's in God's hands as to whether she continues to have a job or gets fired. So many things are in God's hands. We are not as in charge of our lives as we like to think. You and I can't even control our lifespan. We can't even control the length of time for which we're here. We can't even say what tomorrow will bring. Do not boast about tomorrow, the Bible says. You do not know what a day will bring forth. Yes, plan for tomorrow, think about tomorrow, put things in place for tomorrow, take precautions for tomorrow, but don't boast about tomorrow. We have no idea what a day will bring. Jesus told a parable about a rich man who'd done very, very well. And he'd, his farms had brought in bumper crops. The only problem he had was where was he going to put it all? And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns and store all this up, and then I'll have enough to live off for many years. I can retire early. I will eat and drink and be merry. But he didn't know what a day would bring. He was not in control of his life to that extent. He was boasting about tomorrow. And as the Lord Jesus taught it, God said to him, You fool, this night your life is required of you. And who will get all these good things you've stored up? We are not so much in charge of things as we like to imagine as human beings. Plan for tomorrow, provide for tomorrow, organize for tomorrow. But don't boast about tomorrow. We are not all-powerful. But God is all-powerful. And nothing is too hard for the Lord. Now, when we say God's all-powerful, we mustn't assume that God does nonsense things. God doesn't make 2 plus 2 equal 5. So that every time you have two things and two more things, another thing mysteriously appears. <laughs> so 2 plus 2 somehow isn't 4 anymore, it's 5. That's not a powerful thing that God could do. That's a nonsense thing. It's not that it's too hard for him, it's just ridiculous. Or what about this one that people have said to you maybe? Can God make a stone that's too heavy for him to lift? It's impossible for him to lift the stone, if he can make it, but if he can't make it, then he can't make it. It's impossible for him to make it. He can't do everything. Well, again, it's a nonsense idea, really, because there's no such thing as a stone that's too heavy for God to lift. And if there's no such thing, then he can't make it, because it doesn't exist. It's impossible. Not because he's weak. 
but because it's just a ridiculous idea. God is all-powerful. But there are certain things more seriously that he won't do. That we should not expect him to do. For example, he will not go against his own character. He cannot deny himself. He's not a God who does arbitrary things and random things. He does what he wants to do, but what he wants to do is always consistent with his own character. So there is a predictability about God. He acts in line with what he is. So, specifically, he cannot lie, for example. That is not possible for him because of the kind of God he is. You could say he doesn't want to lie. He will never want to lie. It's impossible for him to want to lie. So that is something that God will not do. Then again, in line with his character and consistent with the kind of God he is, he cannot be tempted with evil. Evil has no attraction for him at all. There's nothing in him that warms to the idea of evil. There's not one tiny part of his personality that thinks that evil might be good or desirable or uh, he cannot be tempted with evil. He will not go against his own character. So there are limits. God is all-powerful, but there are limits that come from God. (laughs) Here's another one. God cannot ignore sin. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, the Bible says of God. We were asked last night, Neil, the speaker here, was asked, why is there so much suffering in our world? Why is there so much pain? Why doesn't God make everyone happy? Well, the answer, part of the answer, is that God allows human sin to continue for a short time. But that can only ever be a temporary thing. That can never be a long-term thing because it goes against his very character. His eyes are too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate sin. He can't ignore it. He can't pretend it doesn't matter. He can't brush it under the carpet. He can't sweep it away. He can't say, well, there, there, everybody does this kind of thing. He cannot do it. He's not that kind of God. That's not what he's like. He tolerates human sin for a short while, which explains why our world is so painful and difficult. But the good news is this cannot go on forever. It won't go on. He cannot ignore human sin. And the Bible tells us that he will one day root out of his world all causes of sin and all evildoers. And you say, well, that's impossible in this world. But is anything too hard for the Lord? He is all-powerful. Imagine one of those old-time prospectors with their sieve and they've got the the mud from the bottom of the river and they're, they're shaking it in this tray and the mud's all dropping through and all the silt is dropping through. and They're just looking for those nuggets of gold and as they wash the mud through, the gold, they hope, will appear. In the same way, God with his almighty power will separate out from his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. He must do it. It's his character. He can't allow this world to continue forever. He has two pure eyes to look on evil. And the result will be a beautiful, peaceful, harmonious world. A world which is the home of everything that's right. Everything that's good. A world in which God is known and loved. And a world in which we are at home. A world in which God himself will console us for every grief and pain. But in order to get to that world, God must put forth his full power over his enemies who oppose him. He must not let this opposition and hate for him continue. It cannot continue. Every wicked person, every proud person, every selfish person, Every dishonest person, every angry person, every abusive person, every godless, unbelieving person will fall in that day. 
and you do not want to be one of them. You do not want to be the enemy of this all-powerful God. You do not want to stand against him or oppose him. You do not want to fight against him or shake your fist in his face. Listen to this prediction of the future from the last book of the Bible. It's put in picture language. I looked and behold there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. This is more extreme, isn't it, than even the extreme theories that you get on the internet about the future, the extreme implausible conspiracy theories and so on. This is more extreme, more dramatic, bigger and more drastic. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. This is God exercising his power against his enemies. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Great rulers and powerful people are hiding there alongside the slaves and the peasants and the nobodies because they are calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Who can stand against an all-powerful God? And he finally comes against his enemies. Do you really think that you can resist this God? Give up your fight against him. It's hopeless. No longer think that you can tough it out against him. Give in, surrender, make peace. The enemy of God, one great preacher said, has about as much security and about as much safety as the spider on its thread dangling over an old-fashioned open fire. And you say to yourself, surely that spider will drop in at any second. And it will. But then again, can we save ourselves? We need his power for that. Many things are too hard for us, but is anything too hard for the Lord? God is not like us. He is able to do everything he plans to do, everything he says to do, everything he promises to do, however unlikely it seems to us. He can even rescue his enemies and turn them into his friends. Now, the question I've been asking, is anything too hard for the Lord? I think you'd have to be a Bible expert to know where that comes in the scriptures. It comes from the story of Jeremiah. And there was a time in Jeremiah's life when the city he lived in, Jerusalem, had armies all around it, Babylonian, Chaldean armies. It was a siege. And Jeremiah's message all the way along had been surrender to the Babylonians. All the people in Jerusalem had been thinking, God will deliver us. God will send a great rescue. Let's just hang on. Surely the Lord will deliver us. And Jeremiah, speaking on God's behalf, said, no, God will not deliver you. The best thing you can do is stop fighting and surrender. Then you may find your lives are spared. This was not a popular message, and it got Jeremiah in trouble. And at this point in his story, he's in prison in the court of the guard in the palace of the king. And the Babylonians are at the gates. Imagine the atmosphere must be a little bit like Berlin in 1945, if you can imagine that, where the city's bombed to ruins and the Russians are coming in from one side and the Americans from the other, and it's all over, and everybody knows it's all over, but nobody knows what's going to happen next, but they know it's not going to be good. So this is the feeling in Jerusalem as the Lord speaks to Jeremiah. And the Lord tells him to do a surprising thing. He says, you should buy a field. Your cousin is going to come to sell you the field in your hometown of Anathoth, where the Babylonians are, and you should buy it from him. Sure enough, his cousin Hanamel, the son of his uncle, the son of Shalom, his uncle, came to him and said, I want to sell you my field. Will you give me money for it? Well, what use is a field when your city is under siege? But Jeremiah said, yes, I will buy this field from you. And in front of a whole crowd of people... They weighed out the price of 17 
shekels. They got the paperwork and they signed it and witnesses signed it and it was sealed and put into an earthenware vessel to last for a long time. Because, Jeremiah said, this is what God says, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. And it seemed an impossible thing. How could such a thing happen? This whole place is, a, is about to collapse. It's the end. But now you've got this purchase, this field that you've signed, this document, and put it in a jar to last for a long time. So after this, Jeremiah prayed. And he said, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And the gist of his prayer as he goes through is something like this. God, you have been very, very good to us. We have been your people. You have favored us. You have shown us kindness. You brought us out of Egypt. You rescued us through the ten plagues and the Red Sea. You gave us this land to live in. You have been very good to us. And we have not been good to you. We have put you behind our backs. We have ignored you. As a people down the centuries, we have rejected you and worshipped other gods. We have got to the point of burning our own children as offerings to these false gods. So we thoroughly deserve everything that's coming upon us. Everything that these Babylonians are about to do is exactly what we deserve. But is anything too hard for the Lord? It's a statement at this point of whether God can go beyond punishing sin and do something different with people who really have only ever sinned against him. Can he do something more than just give them what they deserve? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in answer to this prayer. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And the Lord goes on to explain that, yes, the Babylonians will capture the city. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, will capture it. They shall come and set the city on fire. Everything that Jeremiah is worried about, everything that people are hoping won't happen, God says it will happen. The whole place will be set on fire. All those houses with their flat roofs, God says, all those flat roofs where you used to worship Baal, they'll all be burnt down. They will all go. All those drink offerings that provoked me to anger, they'll come to an end. Yes, God says it's true. The children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. They've done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands. This city has aroused my anger from the day it was built to this day. All of them are involved. The kings, officials, priests, prophets, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They turn to me their, their back and not their face. That's a pretty rude thing to do even to your, your sister or your husband, just to turn your back. But God says they've turned their back to me. And they should have come face before me to worship me. They've ignored me. They've put me behind their back. And I've taught them persistently, God says, and they never listened. They set up their disgusting gods in my temple. They built high places in the valley to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch. And I never commanded this, and it never entered my mind that they should do this horrible thing. But is anything too hard for the Lord? Jeremiah's got his deed of this field in this clay jar. All these reasons why God should destroy this people and forget about them, and just have done with them, just wipe them away. He would be justified in doing so. Nobody could complain. Nobody could say it's unfair. Nobody could say it's too harsh. All down the generations, they've pushed and pushed and pushed. They've never changed. But is anything too hard for the Lord? Yes, God says, after the disaster, I will gather the people back to this city from all the countries to which they've been driven. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Is that too hard for God to do? To teach these people to love him and fear him and respect him and worship him? 
And he says, I will make with them an everlasting covenant to do them good. Well, that sounds as though it must be too hard for the Lord to do good to people who sin against him so continually. But he says he's going to make a covenant, a commitment. A commitment in which he commits himself. Here's another thing God can't do. He can't break his promises. He can't break his covenants. If he commits himself, he's committed. To deny a covenant that he makes, that would be to go against his whole character. And he says, I'll make with them an everlasting covenant. I will do good. I will put the fear of God in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness. So there's going to be fields bought and sold again. The people will come back after the disaster, after the judgment. The people will come back. There'll be the buying and selling of fields. Jeremiah or his descendants will be able to dust off that jar and dig out the deed that was signed and say, this field is ours. Our father or our grandfather, Jeremiah, bought it. And here's the deed of purchase. But it's not much more than that. God says there will be a full answer to this whole problem of sin. This whole issue between God and the human race, he will resolve. Not negatively in judgment and destruction, but positively in change and transformation and life. And people learning to fear the Lord, learning to worship God and love him and serve him from the heart. You say, well, that's impossible. But he says himself, is anything too hard for me? He is the all-powerful one. How does this come down to us today then? How does this relate to us here all these years later? God's determination hasn't changed. He still will have a people who worship him from the heart, a people who love him, people who praise him, a people who he can bless, people who, as he says, I will do them good all their days. He says, I will put the fear of me in their hearts for their own good and the good of their children. His everlasting covenant has not stopped. He's still, it's not like the Jehovah's Witnesses where it all stops when you get to the number of 144,000. That's that's the limit, cut-off point. This covenant has people added in and added in down the generations. How? What is the power of God today? Evidently, it's not too hard for God to turn things around, to make enemies into friends. To overcome deep selfishness and pride and sin in our lives. It's not too hard for him. But how do we experience that power today? Later on in the Bible, we get this statement. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message concerning Jesus Christ and his violent, gruesome, sacrificial death on the cross, that message is powerful. It's God's power. It's the power of God at work in our world today. It's the powerful way that God effects this great change. Whereas by rights he should be hostile to those who have offended him and done wrong and greeted him with the back rather than the face, as Jeremiah heard, this is the way that he transforms the whole situation. The message of Jesus Christ crucified, who died in our place, who took responsibility for our guilt, That message is the powerful way God puts things right. Yes, it's true. To many people, it's a nonsense, actually. To many people, it's ridiculous. Jesus dying on the cross, what's that? Load of nonsense, load of rubbish, madness, crazy. How can you believe such things? But not for everybody. For many people also, this is the powerful word of God. As we hear of Jesus Christ dying to take responsibility for our guilt before God, so that message changes us and it works within us. 
it begins to stir up new attitudes within us, a new outlook, a new sense of what we can be, what we should be, how we can relate to God, how we don't have to fear him and hide from him, how we don't have to fear his anger, his punishment, how we can have that sense of peace and confidence with God. One of the booklets on here, How Can I Forgive? One lady came up to talk to us today and she had a terrible story to tell, really. A really sad story, going back to when she was a child and then as an adult she'd had her children taken from her into care and it was to do with her own family speaking against her and all sorts of things she was saying. And that was the booklet that I gave her. I said, I I hope you'll accept this booklet. And she said, "I, I can never forgive my mother. I can never forgive her. But this word of the cross is powerful to soften that hard heart that says, they've done too much, they've hurt me too much. I can't possibly forgive them. Because it's a message as to how God forgives us. A great cost to himself. At the price of his own son. It's a powerful word. This is how God works. This is how we experience his power in the world today to transform and restore and put things right. And more than what it does to us, even, although that's powerful enough, more than the impact of the message inside us, it objectively changes things. It doesn't just change how I feel, although that's powerful enough to teach me and you to forgive instead of to hate our enemies. That's a pretty powerful message in itself. But there's more than that because it actually brings us to God, objectively. Subjectively, yes, I feel the power of the message and its impact in my life. But more than what I feel, more than what I think, more than what it does in my heart, it actually reconciles me to God so that he becomes my father. And all the good things that he has for his people are mine in Jesus Christ and the message of the cross. The message, yes, it's an amazing message. It's a wonderful message. It's a powerful message. But more than that, as I turn to Christ and believe in him, this message resolves that whole problem of sin and gives me peace with God. Seems impossible if you understand God and sin and guilt and the nature of God and the character of God. Seems impossible that people like us should ever find peace with God. It seems an extraordinary idea, but is anything too hard for the Lord? The word of the cross, yes, it might be folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is indeed the power of God. Now, in a moment, I'm happy to take your comments and questions as we had last night, but first, let me pray.